Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Well, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I am Eki Tepsipornchai. Well, brother, it's good to be uh, back with you another week. We had a good episode last week. I think we're going to have a, a good episode this week. Might be a little bit touchy for some folks. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the topic of, of worship, um, you know, I think, I think we'll get a lot of uh, agreement on, on worship itself, but when it comes to the execution and, and how we apply that to the music, especially contemporary Christian music, I, uh, this is always a hot topic. Yeah, it, you know, it really shouldn't be. So we're, we're talking about worship specifically. We're talking about um, music and, you know, how, how do we know what music we should play? We shouldn't play. Uh, I mean, let's just kind of dive right in there. Yeah. Um, I, I think what you see today is tension over whose music you're playing. Right. Right. The, the question comes, does it matter the source of the music? Well, does it matter? Yeah. And, and I think um, th- there's a couple of ways that we can at- attack this. And we're looking at the extreme examples that I think we're, go- we're all going to agree on. I mean, first of all, you know, the worship music that we lift up should be glorifying to God. I, I don't think that would be a controversial statement. And for it to be glorifying to God, I think it has to contain lyrics that are theologically true. I mean, it's just like when you go through the Psalms, the Psalms were there for the people of God to be able to sing um, praise and glory to, to God. And of course, there was different Psalms for different purposes, but many of them were served that purpose of being able to, to, to praise God just, uh, just in song. And when you look at those Psalms, they are theologically rich. They're based upon um, God's truth. And so we we recognize that the music we want to bring is going to be theologically rich. And, and I would say that you, you want it to be deeper rather than shallow. Um, there's a lot of good music out there that you know sounds really good. It's true, but it stays at a superficial level. And yeah. I think that as a church grows in their understanding of God and Jesus Christ and, and the word, um, I, I think the the, the more they're, they're going to get out of singing songs with, with richer depth. And also those songs with richer depth, as you get to get used to singing them, um, they can serve as almost as a reminder to you as you sing them back to yourself uh, of a lot of uh, God's rich truths uh, that are in the Bible. I think where we start to really um, get some friction is when we start talking about contemporary Christian music. Yeah. And uh, let, let's, let's go to the extreme examples. So there is Bethel Church and Hillsong. Um, what do you think, uh, Nathaniel? Uh, what's your uh, What's your mindset towards Bethel and Hillsong? Yeah, you know, I would love to listen to Bethel um, and and uh, Hillsong all day long if I were and deaf. Elevation too, Elevation yeah, too, yeah, Elevation too. If I were deaf, um, <laughs> but as long as my ears work, my soul can't take it. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, there's some big problems with those, and uh, let me say this. It, the reason I know immediately people are like, oh, but they have amazing songs. It, you know what they actually do? Um, Elevation, Hillsong, Bethel Music have amazingly gifted and talented musicians uh, and vocalists. And and this is, you know, I, I don't think anyone that uh, understands music can deny the talent. And, and so, but that's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about what's appropriate uh, to bring before the Lord, to worship God, to edify the church, um, you know, to, to praise God. And we look at these kind of things and we have to ask a question, um, d- does this, well, one is the music, as you say, you know, just very surfacey, or is it theologically rich? Now, I would actually argue that a lot of their music is rich in theology. It's just very poor theology. Um, and, and then when you go to the source of that, you're leading people to just, you know, churches and their teaching and their doctrines that aren't even Christian in a lot of ways. And that sounds extreme, but, you know, my general premise is uh, if, if a band is still living and I want to use their work, then they have to be theologically solid in terms of what they're teaching Sunday to Sunday. Um, it, if it's some, if it's someone that got off in some areas 
in theology, in their doctrine, and they've been, you know, dead for a long time, and they're not someone you can actively follow, then I, I might be a little more lenient depending on the song and how long ago that person's deceased. What, what, what's your thoughts on that? Because I know a lot of people will vary a little bit there. Yeah, I, I, I agree that um, a lot of these um, contemporary songs, they, they sound really good. You know, I, I think what we want to be careful of is being um, led to judge a song by the way it makes us feel. Um, absent the lyrics, right? So I think um, there's there's a lot of songs that that sound really good. It's got a got a nice uh, catchy um, kind of chorus line uh, that that people love to sing, and uh, and then and then that's good enough. And and you can have the same lyrics just kind of repeated mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, when it comes to uh, music like Bethel or Elevation or, or Hillsong, um, I agree with you. I, I think the, the the songs themselves may be great and and. By the way, from people that I know that have looked at their songs, it's kind of a mixed bag sometimes. Uh, sometimes you'll find some that are really good, some that are not quite as good, uh, at least in terms of the lyrics. Yeah. But, but here's, the, here's the issue. Um, we can't vet every single contemporary Christian music artist out there. Okay, we, we can't assure that everyone that we might play is going to have a solid view on the Bible. All we have to go off of is the lyrics. So the lyrics will tell us a lot. But yeah. the other thing, too, is what is the church that they're kind of connecting themselves to? Right. Um, there are a lot of independent artists out there, and, and I get that, and, and some of them are, are excellent, um, you know, but we, we also want to be careful about turning them into kind of rock stars um, that we start yeah. to follow around and treat almost like they're pastors when they're not. Um, many of them go through the same struggles that other Christians go to, to go through. They just happen to be musically gifted. Um, so when we look at, <clears throat> for instance, Bethel Music, I think the main concern I have from my standpoint is that Bethel Church, when you look at Bethel Church, um, that is not a church that anyone with sound doctrine can affirm. Yeah. Um, I, there's there's a lot of problems there. There's a lot of problems with what they teach. Um, there, there's a lot of teachings that are unbiblical, um, very unhelpful, and, and will lead people astray. And so, when you get a church like that, and they have this music um, that they put out there. Some people say, well, the music's not the same thing as the church. Well, the, the music is, it, that, that music gets sold. That, they have albums that's sold. They, they're played on the radio. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the idea is that that music serves as a marketing arm for the church. Um, that's what draws people to the church. In fact, I remember going through seminary and uh, John Martin, uh, one of the uh, singers at Grace Community Church, great guy. He came in and uh, he's talking to us seminarians. And he revealed, here are the top three reasons or the top three factors that go into um, picking a church for people. He's saying, this is not what I suggest. This is just the reality. And, and I think number one was the youth ministry. You know, what's the youth ministry like? Number two is what's the music like? Yep. Number three, what's the preaching? What, what is the preaching like? And so the sad reality is that people are more likely to go to a church with poor preaching and good music mm-hmm. uh, than the yeah. opposite way around where the music may not be um, as pleasing to the ear, but the, the, the teaching is solid. And, and so when you have a arm of, when you have this band, when you have this music, Bethel music that produces great music, there may be a lot of people that are drawn to that church based upon the music itself. And then you go there and now you're being inundated with all kinds of wrong theology. Yeah. That's never, that never shows up in the music. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I can attest personally to at least two of those three top things uh, that he mentioned, um, it, you know, planning a church here in Alaska, the the first two things that we or three things that we get right. Music is almost always number one. Right. Yeah. Um, and youth ministry is normally the third one for us. Like, what do you have for your youth? The second one, of course, we get is, you know, are you a non-judgmental church? Which basically just means, <laughs> yeah. you know, can I get away with my sin? You know, um, no. but music is almost always number one. And in fact, in all my years of ministry, that's been pretty true too. Um, and, and exactly. the And so the problem is uh, people will... Yeah, not look at the preaching, not look at the doctrine. Uh, they find musicians who are excellent as musicians, um, and and they'll go to those places. And so, and it's dangerous. You know, since we're talking about uh, Bethel, no, so we're talking about Bethel music attached to Bethel Church out in Redding, California, pastor by Bill Johnson. Let me just, while we're on this subject, read a couple quotes uh, from Jen Johnson, firstly, and then from Bill Johnson, just to let folks 
know um, a little bit about their doctrine and why we're saying it's so dangerous. Um, so, but, but before I do that, let, let me back up a little bit. Um, I think it's peak naivety to believe that a church can have a band and people can listen and it not lead them to that church. Um, I, I think we don't understand the power of music just on the human person, right? Music moves us. Um, it, it's what makes you tear up in movies. Oftentimes it's what makes you happy. Oftentimes, um, don't believe me, watch an emotional movie and turn the sound off and you won't even come near the level of emotion. And I don't care who you are. Um, you, you know, you're move, we're moved by. And so music's a good thing, right? I mean, God has created music in such a way that it is meant to move us in, in good ways and healthy ways. Uh, but that means when, music for believers is tied to the things of God, something very personal for us, right? A a relationship with Christ, whether it's good theology or bad theology, if you listen long enough, you're going to start being drawn in to what's being taught simply because you have these good feelings and emotions from the music. So I think it has a far deeper effect on us than what we consider. And just as you said, it it ends up people going to Bethel just because of their band. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great point. Um, music does have an effect upon our soul, our, our spirit. Right. Um, and and uh, that's by design. I mean, music, music is an invention that's only made possible through God. And uh, we know David um, was not only a psalmist, but, but he was a man of instruments. Right. So he mm-hmm. brought, he yeah. brought lyre and, and, and other instruments like that uh, to, to the fore to, to kind of play up these, these psalms. And, and so music is, um, is something that is meant to help, I would say regulate or help build up our emotions, um, but done correctly, done God's way, um, it should help build us up based upon the truth of God. Um, yeah. And it should lead us to a place where now we're ready to really throw ourselves into the word of God to hear what's being proclaimed to, to really just with the rest of the body of Christ, um, hear the word of God uh, being preached and ex- explained and applied into our lives. And, and that's all also part of the worship experience, which leads me to, to my next point. Worship is not just the music. Right. So yeah. a lot of people, they'll go to a church service and they only consider the music itself to be the worship segment. Well, no, the worship is all of it. And, and yeah. really, it should be centered around the preaching. You know, we um, the, the Word of God exists for a reason. The Word of God is is meant um, for us to to study and to hear it proclaimed and to hear it applied to our hearts and, and to use it to change us, right? It's to help renew our minds. We see that in the scriptures um, on multiple occasions. And, and so, the, the entire church service is a service of worship. And one thing that I explained to my congregation not too long ago, and they actually appreciated this, um, was that, um, you know, we open up with a few songs and we have announcements, we have a few more songs, and we go into the preaching. But one of the things I told them is that, you know, those songs in the beginning of the service, that's not there as filler so that you can just kind of come in late and, you know, and and, uh, just get there in time for the Mm -hmm. preaching. That's actually there for you to help set your heart and your mind right before the Lord, to help remind you of the goodness uh, of God upon the great things that he has done, the, the testimonies that we have in scripture. And by the time you get to the sermon itself, your heart and your mind should already be completely locked in and ready to receive the word of God proclaimed. Yeah, absolutely. And so you you use music you to get to that stage. And then w- when you're led to whoever you're led to, you get to the sermon. And if it's really poor doctrine, I mean, again, your, your heart's been prepared for what's yeah. coming, right? And so if it's bad, uh, you can get sucked into that very easy. So let me, let me go back now to quoting these few things. Why? Uh, wh- one of the problems with uh, listening to Bethel music, um, and, and again, you have to understand that um, especially younger guys, they look up these bands, they find where they go to church and they are led to that. So it's very, it's not um, minor in terms of the number of people who are led to false churches just through their music. You know, it, it's a big deal. Okay. So you're listening to Bethel uh, music. Maybe you're playing their stuff in their church and you're thinking, all right, Eki, Nathaniel, surely it's not all that bad. I've heard some things, but I don't know a whole lot, but the music is just quality. Um, it, it's true. Some of their songs, I really have very little doctrinal issue within the song itself. So why can't we just play those? All right. Um, Jen Johnson, 
part of Bethel Music. Let me just uh, read a small quote for you. She was doing a teaching for, I think, the youth ministry there. You can find this. It's all public. Um, This is the kind of thing that should your youth or should your people in the church or should you yourself hear Bethel and think, man, I wonder, their music's so good. I wonder what the preaching's like. This is a taste of what you'll get. Jen Johnson, and I quote, She's, uh, by the way, she, so she's going to be talking about the angels circling the throne of heaven in the book of Revelation. I thought of those angels circling that throne, and I thought, I bet they text each other. I bet they have farting contests, end quote. Wow. Now, generally, wow. It, it, anyway, the, the point is the level of irreverence, and yeah. unless you believe this is an isolated event, it's not. Um, the, the irreverence that comes out of that church is astounding. But just consider that you're, you're talking about describing the holy angels circling the, the very throne of God, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Right. That's what they're doing for all eternity. Yeah. And she describes that picture this way. So this is what Bethel music leads you if you follow uh, to the source. Let me read you another one. Now, this is from the pastor, Bill Johnson. So listening to Bethel music, it's very easy to look up, find it comes from Bethel. Their music's good. Their teaching must be good, right? Bill Johnson, the pastor. uh, This is actually from a a book he wrote. So you can go find this yourself. When Heaven Invades the Earth, chapter seven, uh, a couple paragraphs in. Uh, Just just listen to this very carefully and, and, and you'll catch this. Let's see if our listeners can catch the problem with this. Quote, Jesus lived his earthly life with human limitation. He laid his divinity aside as he sought to fulfill the assignment given to him by the Father to live life as a man without sin and die in the place of mankind for sin. Did you catch that? He yeah, laid so, <clears throat> aside his divinity. Now, this is, isn't the only place Bill Johnson teaches that Jesus was not actually on earth as God, but man only. I mean, this is an old heresy, right? Um, yeah. and, and this one might be a little more subtle to a lot of people, but if, if you're teaching from a place where you believe that's true, you just have to understand that that touches almost every other major doctrine you could teach in a church because it touches the person of Christ. Yeah, agreed. And, and if you have a chance, uh, for those listening, if you haven't watched the movie American Gospel, um, in Christ alone, there are several segments in there where you get a taste of what Bill Johnson is teaching. Um, he would deny the sovereignty of God, that God is in control of all things, that God is in control of evil. In fact, he considers that, if I remember correctly, he considers that to be heresy. Um, so, But the, the Bible is very clear about that. I mean, that's Joseph saying to his brothers after their father died, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. Yeah. And that's Romans eight twenty eight. God causes all things to come together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so we, we see um, that Bethel Church is just not a church that affirms what the Bible teaches. They introduce a lot of things that are not there. Um, and, uh, and even they're well known for their faith healing practices. And, uh, you know, they have these um, almost like seminars that happen, I think, two or three times a year where people are welcome to their church to kind of take these seminars and learn how to do faith healing and all that. And um, their their first one in like 20, the, the year 2020 was scheduled like one month after the COVID shutdown happened. And what did they do? They canceled it. They canceled it and said, due to the concerns over COVID, um, we are canceling um, this seminar. Well, Isn't that a little bit ironic? Because if there's ever a time where you would want to be able to prove that faith healing is real, you would think it would be during a pandemic. Um, But that's 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 just not the case. And so they're they're emphasizing it. And and when it comes to faith healing, look, you might believe um, that people have the ability to faith heal. But what I'll say is this. The Bible does not emphasize that as something for us to pursue. Rather, we are to pursue the knowledge of God. Yeah. And and no one ever learned that by the way, any of the gifts uh, as it were, but I I, I mean, it was even a good point too, brother. It was even more ridiculous than that. So uh, Bethel church and, you know, I came out of the charismatic church, so I'm very familiar with the practices. They have a weekly um, healing rooms meeting, right? So Mm. uh, healing rooms, if you're not familiar with that, 
basically you can, you know, every week you can come into these healing rooms and there's typically two or three or four people, you know, that stand around you and they pray for God's instant miraculous healing and all that sort of thing. Well, not only did they cancel this seminar, to, I didn't even know about that, but they actually canceled their healing rooms, like their yeah, weekly yeah. healing rooms be- right, right. because they didn't want anyone to get, get sick. Healed. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So, okay, we don't want sick people to come to the healing rooms because right. they might get people sick. <laughs> um, anyway, and so, um, it, it, you know, and then it, if, if you thought it couldn't get any more ridiculous than that, um, several weeks later, they reopened their healing rooms, but they reopened them online uh, via Zoom yeah, so course. that you could get miraculously healed over the Internet and no one would get sick. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so. the, this whole this whole past year, I mean, with the um, covid pandemic, uh, whatever it is you want to say about it, um, what has been very clearly true is that um, there has been no documented cases of faith healing over someone who was sick with COVID, right? So um, all the deaths that happened, the people that uh, got infected and the various medications and now the vaccines uh, that uh, are being mandated in various places, um, none of the solution ever involves going to find a faith healer. And not only that, but um, take it a step further. When we think about the charismatic church and think about the prophets, um, there are many prophets who are supposed to be fortune tellers. Well, every single one of those prophets that I heard that made any kind of prediction about the 2020 election were proven false. Oh, yeah. Right? Everyone. Because, uh, yeah, every one of them was on the side of Trump. And by the way, let me just take this moment. I, I know there's a slight rabbit trail here. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, though people may support Trump, and I'll just say this right now, I did vote for him last year. Um, spiritually, he is not someone who I would commend as someone who can, so that that's, you can get spiritual advice or that he would be an example spiritually for. I mean, even the decisions he made to um, install Paula White as his main advisor, who is a heretic as well, female teacher, heretic, very much in this word of uh, word of faith movement, prosperity um, movement. Um, so we see a lot of in this movement to that, that really kind of surrounded Trump. One of the biggest downsides was really kind of the that the spiritual um that the spiritual aspect that got a lot of attention which was the prophets and and the faith healers and whatnot look they all proved to be false um so all that to say this um it's a lot better to be at a church that's simply just teaching the bible rather than interjecting what people want to hear or what people want to believe yeah. you know people came from all over to um, find Jesus Christ because he was healing, he was exercising demons, he was performing miracles. Um, but even in Mark chapter one, when Simon Peter went to go look for him, said, hey, everyone's looking for you. What did Jesus say? He said, well, let us go to the next town then because because I came to preach. And yeah. then when we yeah. think about that, the preaching is exactly what we need because that that feeds our spiritual needs. Um, the healing and the miracles, those are physical things, but th- those are only temporary. They're meant as a sign. They point to the real thing. Um, and and um, that's that's the problem with a lot of these churches that that push um, these, uh, the, these gifts to being for today when they're not being practiced or exercised or confirmed in any way that's consistent with what Scripture says. Yeah, and, you know, so just to tie all this back into the worship, the point is, you know, if you're playing music from these guys, this is what you're ultimately leading people to. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's been interesting. I have over the years, I, I've seen guys in, you know, otherwise solidly reformed churches. And then you get to know folks a little bit and you, you find out that they're listening to some of these uh, songs uh, on the side. And then you find out that they have a book or two, right, from yeah. from Bethel Church. Uh, and you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, and, and you just see how one thing naturally leads to the other. Uh, and, and and it's dangerous, right? So what you don't want to do is lead people to an apostate false religion. And that's what you're doing. If you're playing Bethel music, you're, you're, you're leading people to a source that teaches that Christ isn't uh, you know, he came as man only, not he, he left aside his divinity, as Bill Johnson said, right? Yeah. He's not fully God. He's just a man. God's not sovereign. And those are just a few of the multitudes of problems. Why there is so much music out there. Why do you have to use Bethel music, right? You right. don't, right? Um, and, and like you said, even if 
you needed to use music that you didn't prefer as much because again, the quality is excellent. I don't think anyone disputes that. Uh, well, I like classical music, so I might dispute a little bit, but, um, but they're excellent musicians, but the problem is you can find all kind of other good music. And even if you couldn't, um, it, it, you know, the preaching of the word is primarily, you know, it's how our minds are renewed. It's how we're taught uh, how to live and practice our faith, not the music. Um, but the music is so important that we need to guard from, you know, same thing with Hillsong, right? You, you use Hillsong stuff. Some of the words are fine. Some of them, but a lot of their music, the, these guys, a lot of their music is very humanistic. Uh, I think you referenced it earlier. You get, you know, one phrase 18 times and it's normally the phrase or something like Jesus loves me. You know, you want to sing a charismatic worship song, just say Jesus loves me 102 times in 30 minutes and you've got a charismatic worship song. Um, or sometimes referred to as the, the, the boyfriend songs, right? It, I mean, they're, yeah. they're songs that, that can be sung about, uh, about your boyfriend, except you just replace the boyfriend with God. Yeah, absolutely. And these are not worship songs. Most of them aren't even godly Christian songs, right? Um, there are certainly Christian songs that we might listen to and uh, enjoy outside of the church ser- uh, setting, but it just because it's a Christian song doesn't mean it's fit for worship. And so there also needs to be that distinction made. I think we we often just think, okay, it's Christian, it's fine, yeah. you know. But ask what is the purpose of the Lord's Day service? Yeah, it's not about you. It's not about how good you can feel. It's not even about the fact that um, Jesus loves you. He does. But it's about coming before a holy God and worshiping God because he deserves to be worshiped. We do that out of love because he first loved us, but you're not the focus, right? Amen. Amen and amen. We are edified through the worship of our God. The the more our God is exalted, the more we are edified. So the, the two are tied together, but it is driven by the purpose of giving glory to God. You know, it's it, when I think back to the Old Testament, we think the first two commandments are the Ten Commandments. Um, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not create any idols, right, of anything on the above the earth, on the earth, below the earth. Um, well, all that to say this, because there are people that look at that and say, wow, this is, your God is a jealous God. He just demands that he be worshipped alone. But I'll tell you this, we are at our best when we are worshipping God. We are at our worst when we are not worshipping him. I mean, that is the story of the Old Testament, that the more Israel turned away from God, the more wicked and sinful they became. Um, So really, the more we focus on God, and God wants us to focus on him because he is holy, he is righteous, he is really, truly the only one worthy of worship. So when we place it upon the person who is actually truly worthy of worship, uh, we actually are edified, we actually become more like more like our Lord Jesus Christ. And that should apply to our music. I, I often hear it described as 7-Eleven songs, right? The, um, the, the same, yeah. I don't know, the same 11 words um, or same seven words mentioned 11 times or something like that. Yeah. But you, you brought up a good point that there are a lot of great choices out there. So there, um, there is um, a, a lot of music that, you know, if, if you say we're going to take this out, then some people are like, oh, but, you know, that, that song really is, um, is just so beautiful and it means so much to me or this person or that person. Um, and th- th- then you get into a debate about, well, are you saying that just because we played this song that people are going to be led to that church here? Well, not in every location. You, you might have a church congregation that doesn't, isn't that curious, right? Yeah. That they aren't going to look online for those, uh, for those kinds of things. But you brought up a great point that there are so many good choices out there. So many good choices out there that really we are, in my opinion, we are without excuse to, in terms of being able to look for, to, to find good beautiful, edifying music mm-hmm. from alternative places um, that where the lyrics are solid and then that's going to have um, have the, the right desired impact upon our congregation. You know, and something else to be said about some of the older hymns, because I remember when I was first saved and it was back in 2007. And at that time, I wasn't as crazy about the old hymns. Right, the the mm-hmm. old hymns they they feel old fashioned. They're yeah. they, they're they're not as um, they, to me they didn't feel as um, musically easy to sing as some of the contemporary Christian songs. And I wanted to sing more of the contemporary kind of music. Yeah. Um. But but as I grew as a believer, 
And as I became more accustomed to singing songs like um, How Great Thou Art and Be Thou My Vision, um, Count, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, um, the, the Church is One Foundation. I mean, I can go on and on. As I became more and more used to singing those songs, the more and more they really began to mean to me as yeah. I grew as a Christian. And now I can go back and sing those songs. And, and, and it does something for me that most contemporary Christian songs cannot mm-hmm. do because it has a depth that most contemporary Christian songs don't have. And, and so that's, that's the other thing too, that um, if you're at a church that is teaching and preaching the Bible and it's going deep and not just staying at a shallow level, then I think you also owe it to the congregation to give them music that's going to help really move with them as they grow in their theology, music that is going to be theologically um, sound, and it's going to really help uh, help stay with that believer as that believer grows rather than reverting back to shallow music. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you hit on a good principle in there, maybe a bit subtle, but I think as we grow in grace and maturity, we come to long for sort of what Paul would say, the meat of the word, um, we start to appreciate songs that have deeper, richer theology. And in today's world, that is generally older things, right? And, and so, the style of music, which is purely preferential, right, uh, becomes less important, and, and the richness and depthness of the theology becomes, you know, more important. Yeah, I, I mean, similar to you, I, I, I kind of like songs with no words. Uh, you, you know, I don't like to hear anyone sing. Um, at least I used to be that way. But, you know, this yeah. just comes from being classically trained uh, brass player in an orchestra. But, um, but when you hear, you know, you're reading the words and you think, man, this is, I can, I can, the words that I'm reading reflect the true faith I'm following. They, they talk about, you know, who Christ is and who God is and his sovereignty and how he has control over his creation. Um, you know, those things are so much more meaningful to me when, you know, things blow up in my life than Jesus loves me yeah. 25 times, you know, right. in three stanzas. Um, yes, I, it, Jesus does love me and I need to know that truth. Um, but when the world's falling apart, I, I need more. I need, wh- I need to understand what that means. What does that yes. mean in my life? What, what does that mean for who Christ is? What does it mean that the God of the universe loved me? It's so yeah. much richer than just, you know, Jesus loves me. Um, unless you're, you know, you're a kindergarten and you're teaching your kids, Jesus love me. Yes, I know. Uh, kind of thing. But if, if you're an adult, it's sort of like, um, if you're an adult, you, you shouldn't be reading the message Bible. Uh, right. it, you know, right. bad, bad contemporary songs are like reading the message Bible. Um, they're, they're just not helpful. And so, and, and again, I think we, uh, when we approach church, that preaching should be the first on the list. If you're looking for a church, um, the style of worship actually shouldn't even be on your list, to be honest, for a mature mm-hmm. believer. We all have preferences, right? Um, right now, we're a super small church, you know, planting here in Alaska. I choose all the worship songs. Um, my wife helps put that stuff together, but I look at everything. I review everything, um, and I'm conscious that I make choices largely based on preferences, but those aren't what's important. They're just preferences, and so we have a mix of things you know we sing some songs that i don't really care for the music style no but that's fine but when you're singing it and you're confronted with the truths of the word of god you know it touches you in a way that the surfacey music can't do yeah and, and let me give a great example of that and and this is one that i i love to go to as an example of um, biblical counseling as an example and which which we're going to talk about in a future episode um, but uh, when we think about that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, um, great song, and that actually comes straight out of the Bible. Um, that's Lamentations chapter three. Um, that's the prophet Jeremiah in tears watching the temple in Jerusalem yeah. burning down. And not only that, but when you read through that chapter three, um, before you hit that part where you see him proclaim, Great is Thy Faithfulness, you mm-hmm. see a very different tone with Isaiah, I'm Jeremiah. I mean, you see, you see a very different mood with Jeremiah. He, he's in deep depression. 
deep, deep depression. And he actually even states that I have no more hope that's been taken away from me. Um, but then there's a turning point where he says, but this I remember, um, that, that God's truths are never failing. Um, and then that leads him to say, "Great is thy faithful. Your your yeah. your um your compassion fails not. Um, yeah, you know their their mercies are new morning by morning. Great is thy faithfulness." And and this is an example where when you know the Bible, when you know that um, that book of Lamentations, what Jeremiah was going through in context, and how he was able to out of the doldrums bring him out mm-hmm. with a great truth of God that was. Probably, and he's probably thinking back to when God revealed Himself to Moses. When Moses said, "Show me, show me my glory." I mean, mm-hmm. sorry. When Moses asked him, "Show me your glory," yeah. and then the Lord put him in a cleft and had a pass, and the Lord passed by in front and said, "The mm-hmm. Lord, the Lord, um, compassionate and and uh, and gracious, uh, full of loving kindness." But w- when you recognize that that theological truth, that that reality of what Jeremiah was was really drawing upon and how that brought him out. That is the theological backing that goes hand in hand with singing that song, that when you sing that song, that's not a song that you sing only when things are going well. Yeah. That's a song that you sing even when things mm-hmm. aren't going well, because it's a reminder to you that yeah. God is always faithful. Yeah. Let, let's compare that to a modern day song, Hill's, Hill song, Jesus, Lover, My Soul. L- l- listen to some of these lyrics. I, in fact, I'm going to read through them kind of quickly so you can see the repetitiveness. What what you've just um, gone through, compare it to this. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon a rock. And now I know I love you. I love you. I need you. I need you. Uh, though my world may fall, though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My savior, my closest friend, I still worship you. And it goes on. Sing it, Jesus, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. Sing it, Jesus. You uh, go down. I love you. I love you. I need you. I need you. Same thing over and over. There is no comparison yeah, between those right. two. One is, I mean, to be honest, this isn't even a Christian song. This is a godless humanistic song because it is all about you. It's all about you. They tack in a few things like Jesus taking you from the miry clay, but you see the problem is you're the subject of everything. Yeah. You're the subject of worship in this song. Mm. You, you could read this and an unbeliever could very easily come to the conclusion that God worships a man. See yeah. how God bends over backwards and does everything for this man. And he just loves you so much. He needs you. Um, compare that to the song you were just speaking about. I, they're worlds apart. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and when you say I love you and I need you, it reminds me of an old Beatles song that I remember hearing as I was growing up as well. Um, But good point. uh, Really, really good point, because when we come to worship, it is first and foremost about God. And we've said that in various ways. Um, But that should also be reflected in the songs that we sing, that it's not about how we feel. It's not uh, about us. Um, Though certainly you can read through the Psalms and you, you can see the psalmist coming to God in pain. Yeah. Um, and, and praying for, for God to um, help deliver them from those kinds of situations. I get that. And then I think there are great, um, there's a lot of gifted people that have taken a lot of psalms, to, psalms word for word, and turned them into actual songs that you can sing, um, you know, according to a, a known beat or a known kind of rhythm or pattern, which I think is, is fantastic. But yeah, when, when you compare the two um, and you sing that song, the lyrics that you just sang, that, that really doesn't take you to anything in the scriptures. Um, but when you sing great is thy faithfulness, that does take you somewhere, yeah, you know, that, yeah. that does remind you of something that God actually taught us himself yeah. and, and used to counsel Jeremiah out of those, uh, out, out, of the, out of the dull drums of depression right there. And, and he, to your point also, um, so we've had a number of people who have moved away and this happens in California. We have a lot of people moving out of California, but especially in our community, a lot of people, they get to that age where they retire, they want to live closer to their grandchildren. So they move out of California, they go to other places. And my number one concern is the church. Um, okay. You're not going to be at this church. I get that. Um, live streaming with, with us on Sundays that you can do that if you have no other option, but you really need to find a home church. Yeah. And so my greatest concern for them is to find a church where they're going to be taught the word of God. And that is the only thing I'm searching for. So when I'm helping them look for a church, I am looking for a church that believes the word of God and teaches the word of God. Yeah. And I, I might, 
you know, I might key in on listening to a, a sermon, watching something online, hearing what they teach, um, hearing how they handle, um, apply the Bible to certain social issues today to get an idea of what they what they believe. One thing I don't do is sit and listen to their music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't find out who's um, who's the singers, uh, what kind of, you know, what's on the lineup of songs that they sing. I, I that that's not a part of my thinking. It is about the preaching. All right. So let me make this point, especially for those of us who are in small churches. Um, I'm in a relatively small church. You, Nathaniel, you, you have a church plant, so that's a very small church. Not all of us have the resources or the bandwidth to pull together a professional sounding band. Um, and I give Grace Community Church. I came from Grace Community Church. They had a full, uh, at times, a full orchestra and a choir in the back. And the music was just majestic. It was awesome. And I remember even for a Shepherds Conference singing with the other TMS men and, and just how, how great they were able to make us sound there as well. But for the, the reality is that for most smaller churches, they don't have that kind of bandwidth. They may not even have um, people that um, can play, uh, play instruments or maybe just a guitarist or something like that, or just a pianist. You know, the, the important thing is that you guys are singing. Um, that you're choosing songs that glorify God, that you guys are singing and you guys are singing with an attitude of worship, that you're using yeah. that yeah. to help prepare you for the rest of the service. You know what? If you have to sing a cappella, you can do that. You know, pick out uh, some songs and some of the, especially those older hymns make great singing. You know, if you're going to do it, um, do it a cappella just, just as a group. So it, it doesn't necessarily need to be at a certain quality. Of course, we would like to have it as at high of a quality as possible. But I think a lot of churches has, have unfortunately um, sacrificed um, fidelity to the scriptures, fidelity to the mm -hmm. purpose in the effort to try to make things sound better. Yeah. And especially yeah. for churches that are trying to cater to a younger audience, because I've seen so many churches that it feels like a rock concert. You know, yeah. you walk into there, you know, you the, the lights are, are dimmed and you've got these singers up there and that the music style is more rockish rather than um, that the kind of music that that will settle your soul and kind of bring your mind and your heart uh, to mm -hmm. God. Um, and, and oftentimes, as we've mentioned before, the, the lyrics are not necessarily lyrics that um, are about God. They're more about uh, the individual. So we want to be discerning about that. So the important thing is not that you have this full band, but the important thing is that you guys are singing and you guys are singing with the right mindset, the right attitude, and that you're singing songs that are true about God and, and helping you to lift up your heart and mind for that purpose. Yeah. And I, you know, I think we need to go back and ask the question, who, who's our audience? Who, who's the audience, right? If, if people are your audience, then by all means, uh, make your band into a concert, right? So that everyone can enjoy and they can leave feel invigorated, but then stop calling yourself a church if you're going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Our audience is God. We, I mean, you're, you're literally coming. We call it the Lord's Day. Uh, it's not your day. It's the Lord's Day. We're coming to worship God. We're coming to worship God individually. We're coming to worship God collectively as the body. Um, and it, it, and, and absolutely we want to do everything that we do as excellent as we can do it. Um, and when there are just natural and resource limitations, that's fine. You, again, I don't, God isn't looking down on any church and saying, oh yeah, I'm not going to receive their worship because they don't have a pianist. Right. That's just right. People may not come to your church, but who cares? Let them go somewhere else because you're worshiping for God. Um, and so if you sing acapella, great, do it. Uh, I mean, that's that we do. Um, sometimes we have a guitar. Most of the time we sing acapella at the moment. We're a small church. Um, I think Grace Community Church is <laughs> their musicians are probably in quite literally about a tenth of our entire city's population. <laughs> 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 yeah, there, there's, uh, there, and, and they have a lot of great singers that go up there, and and, yep. and it's yep. wonderful if you're that size and you have um, those kinds of resources available to you. Great, um, but a smaller church uh, with maybe without any instrumentalists and people just singing a cappella uh, can bring the same glory yep. to God as um, as as Grace Community Church with a with a full yep. orchestra and choir. Absolutely, and so you know, let's just remember who our audience is and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so every worship leader out there, you, I mean, it, you ought to be um, concerned about the quality um, of, of music. And, and I mean, quality in terms of the richness of the text, right? Every pastor ought to be concerned about that. 
Um, I, I know for us, we try to connect, you know, music to what we're teaching in the word. Uh, if we can do that, if we can't do that, you know, the concern is, is, is this music? Pe- look, people memorize better typically anything put to music. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, that's another reason that it matters what songs, you know, you're playing. If the song is just, I love Jesus, Jesus loves me, you know, over and over and over for 30 minutes. Uh, oh, okay. I mean, you haven't gotten past the, the Sunday school song, the very first song everyone learns. Um, yeah. but you know, <laughs> if you're, you know, if you're singing, um, you know, a mighty fortress, uh, it, it, it's just so rich. It, you know, yeah. you're talking about where your strength confides. It's not in you, but it's in God. Um, it, you just get all these rich theological truths. And so it matters because you put it to music and naturally the majority of people memorize that a little better. Uh, and so there's just, just some other little practical yeah. reasons why it really does matter. You're going to, you're going to retain a lot of what you hear through music, which is why you shouldn't be listening to garbage music outside of church either, right? Stop listening to the humanistic yeah, the, all about you music outside of church. It's not right. helpful. Yeah. And, and, um, and going back to some of the old church hymns, and I'm not saying that a church has to sing all hymns. It could be a mixture of hymns. Yeah, we, we do a mixture. We do some contemporary yeah. and we do some hymns because our focus is on the content, right? Right, right. Yeah, our, our church is actually probably more contemporary than hymns, though. I'm trying to get more hymns in, into play. But one of the beautiful thing about hymns, I, I just love the idea that you're singing a song that the church has sung throughout the ages, right? Mm. Um, you have that common bond. You have that common connection. And, and in some ways, it's, um, it's an expression of the fact that God's truth never changes, the same songs that they sang that gave praise to God are the same songs that we sing today that can give the same praise and glory to God. And as we connect theologically with what they believed, um, we can also connect uh, musically with mm-hmm. what they sang because the word of God never changes. Theology never changes. So that's a tremendous blessing in and of, of itself. You know, you, you had mentioned something earlier talking about um, how we discern music. And uh, in the case of um, in the case of bands that play for Elevation or Bethel or, or Hillsong, you know, those are actual churches um, that we want people to avoid today, which is the concern about making their music kind of a standard that, that we would sing. Now, what, what is your position on older music from people who have passed away? Um, lyrics may be really good, and we might find that that person wasn't really a believer. So what is your thought on that? Yeah. And I know some guys will vary with me on this. Um, and I, I actually don't know exactly where, where you are. My general position is if, if people can't go look them up and follow them, if they, they don't have an active, you know, kind of ongoing ministry, they, they've been deceased for some time. I'm generally not as concerned with that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think just to show my consistency, the reason is purely because, you know, they're not producing new material that's heretical. They're not producing new, um, you know, you can't go follow them as they go on a show around the yeah. U.S. So that's that's why I make that distinction. Now, if if kind of, you know, if they've written tons of books and things that I'm aware of and it's all kind of heretical stuff, then I, I'll avoid them as well. But yeah. if it's just a few things here and there, uh, then I'm not as concerned if they've passed away already and it's been some time. Yeah, I think I think it's a case by case basis. And I think one of the one of the best examples is going to be the song. It is well with my soul. Um, yeah. Beautiful yeah. song. Great, great lyrics. But uh, when you look into the life of Horatio Spafford, it, it raises a lot of questions. Um, but he has a long past. Um, he, he's not really well known unless you really go and look for him. And, uh, and, and so I, I, can, I, I can understand churches who have taken a position not to sing that song because of his past. But I can also understand churches that say, you know what, 
He's yeah. gone. He's not a stumbling block to anyone. This song is a beautiful song. It it um, it it really um, it's really singing about um, how no matter what's going on in our life, that that we are always well because of God who's in our life. And and so I can I can understand both positions there, and I certainly wouldn't fault um, either church for either position. But yeah, that is a case that if he were alive today, if he were a well known figure, if he were on social media, someone that people can follow, as you mentioned, which is the danger of a lot of these contemporary Christian artists, because recently we've seen a lot of them walk away from the faith. We've seen a lot of them walk away from uh, from believing in Christ. And when you listen yeah. to the um, listen to the testimonies, why, you know, you, you start to realize, you know what? Yeah. First, first John 2, 19, um, they, they were never a part of the yeah. church because you don't you don't hear a strong uh, gospel testimony there. But, you know, that that could that could be unsettling. You know that we've been singing songs of this person that has left, <clears throat> and I think a, a good um, a good person who has who has recently spoken out, and and I th- I want to say it's the lead singer of um, Skillet. It's an older Christian band. Um, he's the lead singer, and he has actually come yeah. out uh, very very vocally against um, kind of this culture of chasing after contemporary Christian music artists um, because of just how how often they have walked away from the faith, how shallow their own theology is. We, we simply just play them because of their musical gifts. Yeah. And so he's had some great statements as of late, really emphasizing just how important it is to get your music right and to make sure that you're getting it from a sound source and that it's theologically deep and, and rich. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, heaven forbid we ever look harshly on churches who wouldn't play uh, some of those older songs where they have problems. I mean, nobody, your average person has no clue who Horatio is. Um, but if a church doesn't want to play them, you, you know what? Actually, I applaud that. Uh, it, it it just demonstrates that they're being as serious as they can, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, now, you know, barring going on to legalistic areas where we make it something it shouldn't, but good for them, right? Um, but we, but everyone should especially be concerned with playing music from um, it connected to active churches today who have followers who, uh, you know, and, and again, it, you mentioned earlier, and I think it's true, um, especially young believers. And I don't just mean young in age, but young in maturity yeah. um, will often look to singers as though they're a pastor. Yeah. Um, and, and then you get, you know, just this year, we've had maybe four or five um, major famous, you know, pop Christian stars that have, you know, left the faith. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, left the faith having not been Christian for a long time, mm. saying that they've been struggling with this for a long time. Wait, so, so not only is that problematic, but they've been faking their Christianity making money off of everyone, right? Because yeah. that's what, that was their gig, um, which is even worse. So it, it matters. Here's another thing. And I think uh, Justin Peters makes a good point of this. Um, if you're a church and you're playing music from these active bands, um, you, you're supposed to buy into a program. You've got to display it. There are legal things that you have to do. If you're doing it correctly, yeah. Yeah. you are actually funding those churches. Every time you play, Music from Hillsong, music from Bethel. If you're yeah. doing it legally the way you ought to be doing it as a church, you're actually funding them. Every time you play their music, they get a portion mm-hmm. of the money from uh, the license that that you purchase. Yeah, it's the CCLI license. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, uh, yeah, you need to have that license and you need to display it. Um, you need to display it every time you sing their song, give them credit. Um, and, and you're right. I, that there is um, there is funding that uh, that goes towards them. So why not fund uh, someone who um, is putting together some great music and um, is connected to a solid church um, or themselves are um, living um, a life of giving testimony to a godly life? You know, so th- there are just so many good sources that we can go to. There there really is no excuse to go to bad sources to, to say that. Well, we want good music, so we're going to these bad sources. Yeah, absolutely. Don't be lazy. There are a lot of good songs out there. Pick good songs that you can find almost every type of. I mean, look, I was in uh, visited a church a few months ago and they had the worst sort of preference music I've ever heard. It was atrocious. Uh, the song was just fine, uh, but it, it was like electronic techno <laughs> sounding. Oh, my goodness. I, I love the church and the pastors there. 
but I just think, well, uh, good lesson in humility. Um, the, the song is, is the, the words are wonderful and terror and, and yeah. the, 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 the techno stuff is horrible. But anyway, the point is uh, that's just a preference. The songs are rich in good theology. Yeah. So you can find everything you want to find out there. Hymns, uh, more upbeat stuff, even techno, you know, kind of things. Um, but make sure those preferences are way down on the list yeah. um, and that we're singing good, solid songs. And, you know, let me say something else, because I, I've had a few people on Twitter lately um, talk about leaving churches because of the songs they play. Um, I, I mean, this might seem contrary to what we have been saying, yeah. but it, if it, don't leave a church just because you don't like the songs, um, if that is the only thing, no, seldom is that the only problem, right? Uh, sh- very shallow worship it tends to, to come from a low view of God, a high view of man. Often there are other problems, but if the teaching and preaching is rich and it's sound and they're playing Bethel music, um, it, it, please don't leave a church just because of that. Yeah. It, the, the preaching and the teaching is primary. If that's good, then the better place would be go talk to your pastors and elders, go yeah. talk to the worship leader, um, it, you know, lay out a solid biblical case for why you think these are bad things. And if the teaching and preaching is good, um, then in all likelihood, you'll find a group of men who will seriously consider what you're saying. And maybe you are part of, you know, who God uses to just help bring a, a healthy church, even more healthy. Um, Amen. So we got to be cautious about that because I've seen a lot of guys, you know, over the last months who at least what they've posted publicly, they've left churches just because the church is singing Bethel um, yeah. Hillsong music. Yeah, don't do that. Um, you're not going to find a perfect church, right? Um, there are some terrible hymns lyrically also. There are, yeah. Right. And, and I, I hear people singing some of those occasionally and I just think, oh my goodness, that, that that's just as bad as Hillsong. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's even worse because the music's not great and the lyrics are terrible. <laughs> uh, and, and so just, you know, as we're talking about this, don't go to your pastor Sunday and say, hey, I'm leaving because you guys play Bethel music. Uh, that's not what we want. That's not what we're saying. Right. Um, but do lovingly and in a right way submit it to your eldership. Um, confront them if if this is going on in your church prayerfully with the expectation of being someone who builds up your local body, not just, you know, tearing everything down and then, you know, jetting when they don't uh, acquiesce to your requests. Amen. Well, any last words, brother? No, I think that um, that we we covered the the, the gamut, um, or at least everything that uh, I can think of uh, with regards to the topic of worship. And there's there's a whole lot more that that could be said, undoubtedly. But I think when it comes to music, um, I, I think what you're hearing, those who are listening to us, are, are really what kind of goes through our minds when we're trying to think through what kind of song should be sung, should be sung, how should it be sung. But I agree with you. Um, there are a lot of churches out there that uh, may not have all the best music. Um, but if um, they're in the right place with regards to teaching and preaching, that's that's a good start. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, thank you for listening. I would end just on this note. When you're singing worship, if you're the worship leader, you're picking songs. If, like me, you're the pastor and you're a small church and you're the one that does that, you, you don't have another elder doing that. Um, remember who it is we're worshiping. Amen. Uh, um, imagine that. Christ is sitting on the stage and that's who you're singing to rather than um, the other way around. You're singing to the audience because you're not singing to the people in the pews, right? right? Um, <clears throat> this is for the glory of God. Absolutely. So consider that. And I think that will correct a lot of issues. So thank you guys for joining us until next time. Let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.